on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Is the Xbox One the enterprise box of the future? Find out next. Twite on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 42, recorded May 24th, 2013, for May 27, 2013. Xbox One. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code ENTERPRISE. And by RingCentral. We do everything in the cloud. That's why I love my cloud-based phone system by RingCentral. Zero startup costs and RingCentral is $20 per month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial and buy one desk phone and get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. And by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all sizes with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP solutions. Visit techserve.com slash twiet and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And as always, I'm joined by an all-star cast, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin from Enterprise Efficiency. Curtis, how are things in Florida? Things are beautiful in Florida, Padre. It's uh, upper 80s, bright, sunny skies. We like to call this a chamber of commerce sort of day. Makes everybody from the cold, rainy parts of the country think fond thoughts about Florida sunshine. So from the hot, rainy parts of the country, we go to the cold, rainy parts of the country. Mr. Lou Maresca from Microsoft, a regular here on Twite. Lou, it's great to have you back on the program. How does the day find you? Oh, it's been amazing. Thanks for having me, Padre. It's uh, actually it's sunny and not raining today. So we're actually in some luck. Hopefully the long week will be nice. <laughs> yes, yes, it would. Now, of course, we always try to bring in an expert, and we've got an expert of immeasurable measure here. And uh, that is a IE specialist. That's right, interactive entertainment specialist for the Network Solutions Forensic Worldwide Corporation, Mr. Brian Brushwood. Brian, thank you for coming on to Twyatt for being part of the Twyatt Riot. That is the fanciest definition for an expertise of a lazy jackass who plays video games a lot. But that, <laughs> I'll take it, man. I will own this. This is my new, I'm going to get business cards that say exactly all of this. Exactly. That, and that's what we're hoping for. That's the way we roll on Twyatt. Now, let's get right to it. We've got an announcement of, uh, well, it's... It's really kind of earth-shaking, or it was a ball of fail, depending on who you ask. Microsoft just announced their brand new spanking Xbox, the Xbox One. And I, I got to say, if, if you read around the trades right now, it's, it's not getting good press. There's a lot of people who are hating on the announcement. They're hating on the specs. They're hating on the hardware. They're hating on the policy. But we're going to dive a little bit deeper. We want to go past just the surface. What do you think about the Xbox Two? What does the Xbox mean? So let's start with the specs. Here's what we got. It uses an AMD APU, 5 billion transistors, 8 cores, an Ondai ES RAM, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 500 gigabyte hard drive, Blu-ray drive, USB 3.0, 802.11n, HDMI pass-through, second generation Connect, which actually can detect skin shade, so it can detect your heartbeat, and it can also identify people who are using the Xbox, so it can automatically log you in. It's always on, has wide-eye support, no backwards compatibility with Xbox 360 games currently planned, and, well, games are registered to their consoles. Now, that's all the pertinent news in one big bite, but there's a bit more. Brian, you were there with me at the announcement. Tell me, what's your impression of the Xbox One? Man, what? first of all, nothing they would have done uh, short of preempting their own coverage at E3 would actually satisfy people. So they did, they, they, they hedged their bet 
and they said, let's do it. And, and I can't speak for their motivations, but it looked to me like they're like, it's a couple weeks till E3. Let's get the word out. Let's make the announcements of the stuff that a lot of people already suspect. Let's give it a name. Let's go ahead and get it in the public mind. And then that way, when we get to E3, we can make it all about the games. Uh, some of the things they did very, very right is I think the name is correct. Xbox is positioning itself as the single device that belongs in every American family living room. It's the one device to rule them all. Calling it Xbox One uh, is so much better than 720 because 720 was a... Xbox 360 was a coup in naming because they got the word three in there. So it seemed on the same generational platform as the PlayStation 3. It conveyed a panorama that goes all around you and the ability to go anywhere and do anything. 720 either conveys spinning around in circles going nowhere or the lower resolution HD images that you, that you don't like. So by naming it Xbox One, I think they've done the right thing. You notice that the first uh, 20 minutes of the presentation focused a lot on the HDMI pass-through, the ability to control it, uh, to control your television while watching it. And I assume we'll start to see stuff overlaid and we'll start to see interesting partnerships. Uh, but mainly that is their move to make the living room experience babysitter proof. The ability for you to leave someone else in charge at your home system, entertainment system and they just, they just, they just say, uh, turn on CBS and then it's going to find the right channel, put it up and do that. This is huge. It also indicates that they're changing their focus to the other cap capabilities that the Xbox has. Uh, my guess is we'll see a lot more of the gaming side of things, and that's when we'll turn down some of the, um, you know, I don't know, all the fanboys who are fired up right now, I think will calm down once we actually see some of the gaming stuff in a couple of weeks. Indeed, especially E3 coming up. We know we're going to be seeing the other half of the announcement. Now, Lou, I want to turn to you. You're on the Microsoft campus. You've seen all the hoopla. You saw the tent. Uh, I, I would even dare say you've seen a few things that you can't talk to us about. Were you surprised by the negativity that seems to be coming back from the event? I mean, I understand there's always going to be people who are questioning the strategy. They're going to question the design. They're going to question whether or not the device will do what people say they're going to do. But looking at, you know, pretty much every reputable source in the technology world, they are hating on the announcement. They're, they're busting everything from what the Xbox is to the way that it was, it was introduced to the world. Why do you think that is? You know, I'm be honest. I mean, the way they actually did it was, you know, a lot of the things that I actually found out about the Xbox were not even part of the event. It was BAFTA where they had this architectural panel that was done. Um, you know, I think it was Justin TV. They did it and they kind of did a stream of that. And that's where I kind of I started getting super excited about some of the crazy technological things that they did in the in the in the actual device. But a lot of the things they did in the presentation as part of the consumer type presentation is, you know, they, they didn't really kind of get too deep into much of anything. They kind of gave you some high level things, the things that they thought where people were they thought were important to some of the people like you know HDMI in and out and streaming TV and and all of this stuff they didn't get into any some of the kind of the cool technologies behind it and I think that's kind of what Apple does really well is they 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 not only show you the consumer side but they talk about the technology and what they had to do to get there and all the feats they had to be and the people kind of like root for that kind of thing and I think that's that's kind of what they were missing in there yeah, yeah. Curtis, I want to throw over to you and, and bring it back into the enterprise world because I know there's a lot of Twyat Riot right now who are saying, why are we talking about the Xbox 360? Well, let me tell you, there are actually some very enterprisey, and that's not a word, it, but it is now, enterprisey <laughs> features under the hood of the Xbox One. The biggest one being the fact that it's running Microsoft's hypervisor. That's right. They announced that the Xbox One is really two different operating systems. Windows, a stripped down version of Windows, which runs all the menus and gives you the interactivity with, with all your content. And then the video gaming side. It runs on top of the hypervisor, which is what allows us to have the, if you saw the, the demo, the really smooth switching back and forth of tabs. Good technology, but even more importantly, this is technology that was developed specifically for the enterprise. Tell me what it means to you that Microsoft is putting Hypervisor into a game console. Well, I think the big thing that it means is that Microsoft sees their Hypervisor technology as being essentially bulletproof. Uh, it's one thing to put hypervisors into a data center when you know you've got highly trained professionals who are ready to be there to, to, to care for it and feed it and do all of the things that we're used to doing for somewhat complex, very finicky enterprise software. It's something else entirely to put them into a box and give them to what Microsoft certainly hopes will be millions of consumers. 
the good news for the enterprise in all of that is the level of maturity that Microsoft sees in the product in order to be able to do that. Another thing that could have an impact on a lot of enterprise purchasers is that because Windows 8 is embedded in this, it's going to boost the Windows 8 adoption numbers. And as we all know, there is a certain level of fashion, if you will, about what people are going to install, especially in, say, the midsize enterprise. People are leery of committing to a technology that they don't think has wide acceptance and solid support from the vendor. Microsoft is showing that this is a technology, Windows 8, that they do support, that they do have faith in, and we're going to see the numbers go up. Are a lot of enterprises going to directly implement things on Xbox One? No. Uh, some niche use is certainly wide adoption, no. But those underlying technologies, are there things going on there that can influence enterprises and inform the enterprise purchase decision? You bet. Okay. Lou, I want to go back up to you, going to our Microsoft specialist. This is the thing that really, really excites me, excites me and that is the Xbox One is getting virtualized desktop infrastructure into the hands of consumers. They may not know it, but here's the thing. There's very little functional difference between running VMs on my Xbox, my, my hardware in my home, and running it, say, in the cloud. Uh, now, we know that the Xbox One is very cloud-enabled. Is this part of Microsoft's strategy to, to make that whole layer transparent, whether it's being processed on the local machine or processed in the cloud, to, to, to have us think that it's all the same? Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. I mean, basically, if you think about it, what they're trying to do is they're, they, like you were saying before, they have these, these two virtual machines. They have one for apps and one for games. And then they also have the capability, have all these hardware layer capabilities around, you know, GPU rendering in the cloud where they, they have these, what they call infinite worlds, kind of enabling the, like the dynamic walls of the rendering to kind of move out beyond. And they can just load specific things into the memory cache, whether it's, you know, gigabytes of data that doesn't need to be on the screen all at once. And that can be rendered in the cloud and move down to your machine so it, like it's basically built for the dynamic world i mean you know we they talked about you know what was the biggest difference between xbox one and xbox 360 and you know, they talked about hd and hdmi and video and, and all that stuff and i think the biggest difference in the xbox one is the just the ability to the, the, the band the expanding capabilities of it the cloud capabilities of you know of of pushing things to the cloud whether it's cpu whether it's a compression, whether it's, you know, video, whether it's, you know, actual video game uh, AI, uh, all of these different things that can be pushed to the cloud. And that's that's the direct strategy that they're going for. Brian, I want to throw this over to you. Uh, I, I want I want the uh, the consumer view of this. So we talk about VDI a lot on Twite, the whole uh, virtual desktop infrastructure, the ability to say, take my virtualized Windows environment and have it anywhere and, and have it look the same thing. I can bring it up on my laptop, on my tablet, on my phone, on my thin client. By putting VMs into the Xbox One, could you foresee a world where people just see screens? They don't see your game console, they don't see your laptop, they don't see your office PC, they just see an entry to get all the VMs off of wherever they may exist in the cloud. W what would you do as a consumer to be able to have one screen that draws up your Windows PC desktop, that draws up your cloud-based storage, that draws up your video game experience, and you don't know the difference? Yes, well, and I, and I think that we're headed towards that kind of world where you just expect to, to have your access to your own virtual space, no matter what kind of window you're going through. Whether it's as as small as on a you know freaking cell phone, the ability to access you know your space. I'm using air quotes for the audio listeners. I think is something that's coming towards us. Before we get there, though, we're gonna have to see some attitudinal shifts about the way we interact with our devices. For example, uh, it's pretty huge that in this announcement they said that this device is always on. And it occurs to me that there's a two-way street. First of all, being always on means you don't ever have to go through a boot up sequence when you wanna access your virtual space and see your games and your content. But it also means that we have essentially, when these Xbox Ones go all the way across the world, there's gonna be a giant network of interconnected, always on, computer devices. And so if you want to talk about cloud com computing, it's not just all the servers that these Xboxes are accessing, but I, I got to believe 
they're going to use all this idle processing power that's available. I mean, I mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of these units all ready to go looking for something to do. I mean, what what kind of projects? I mean, you know, the first thing you think of is something like the SETI at home type thing. But we could we could accomplish they could make these Xbox hand essentially their own cloud network to support all the Xboxes. Oh, wow. Okay. I, you just opened up a whole new can of worms, Brushwood, as I expect you to do. I want to throw <laughs> this over to Curtis. Now, let's put aside for a second the privacy concerns of someone else using your Xbox to do whatever they want to do. VDI really does allow, this, allow us to do that, right? I mean, it allows us to use resources off of the hypervisor, off of whatever it may be, your Xbox One, your, your server rack, your, your grid rack that you might have in a data center somewhere. So if we suddenly have millions and millions of these high power, high performance machines, all networked, all running VDI, that allows us to tap into some serious power, does it not? Oh, it allows us to tap into some serious power, but I'll tell you what else it allows us to tap into. It allows us, in many cases, to tap into the user agreement for our cable or internet provider user agreement. Uh, that's because I have a feeling that a lot of people who are on asymmetrical links, the typical home link where you've got a much higher speed downlinking than uplinking, are going to find that their ISP defines this sort of VDI or shared computing as running a server at that home location. That's going to be in contradiction to the user agreement in many cases. These are the people, these ISPs, who are, could potentially see a huge impact from all this. Now, do we have a lot of possibility in the widespread application of computing power out to the home? You bet. And in a brief plug, I'll say that Chebert and I, when we wrote our first book on cloud computing, mentioned just that kind of possibility a few years ago. Where we fall down is in having secure ways of doing it, and having ways of doing it that run, don't run into these licensing problems. I don't think we're going to see that until a bunch of people start doing it. But believe me, if we see many, many people using this to, say, game and provide gaming horsepower for their fellow game players, we're going to see the ISPs get involved in a huge way to either charge more or shut it down. Yeah. Lou, let me throw it to you because something else that Brushwood mentioned, as he is apt to do, he mentions things that cause trouble for all of us, is the <laughs> always on feature. This Xbox One is always on. You never turn this thing off. And the reason for that is so that you can say, Xbox, whatever I need. And then it can find Xbox, bring me to ESPN. Or uh, from the announcement, Xbox, show me the price is right. It, it actually will understand that. Now, my understanding is... That's driven by the natural language query engine that Microsoft purchased with Tell Me Networks back in, was it 2007? That's hosted in the cloud, right? That functionality is not built into the Xbox. It has to connect back to the internet to be able to do that. C correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so a lot of the a lot of the stuff, a lot of the processing is done on your on your machine, but a lot of the, what it does is it generates some you know a binary hash of what you're saying, and then that gets then sent up to the cloud, and they find things that match it in a certain way. So there's a lot of technology behind it, but a lot of the so, so it's kind of like equal in both sense. You can't really use the service without that. Um, there are some other variations of it that you can use it without without the internet, um, but obviously it's going to be more accurate if you're using this massive database of data versus you know just what you got on your on your device. So yeah, that's right. definitely a, a, you have kind of a hybrid environment there. Brushwood, let's get to it. What's the nightmare scenario of always on? I I mean I don't know. It, really, it's just you're a pain. I mean, <laughs> man, I'm going to sound like a crazy crackpot conspiracy theorist, but uh, but uh, let's say theoretically that there's a murder in a home and then uh, and that there's a the Xbox was there and it doesn't actually have maybe maybe it's not intentionally recording but but they know that this imagery is uh, is in some buffer of memory and forensically they're able to reconstitute it what happens when all of a sudden just the existence of all these 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 cameras and this, I mean, there's major legal ramifications with this stuff. And I, again, I don't want to say that this is any kind of, you know, conspiracy. I don't want to say it's draconian or Orwellian. But, but, uh, but, uh, like, I could see a world where you could choose to leave it always like a safety buffer thing. Like, I, like, like in your user agreement, 
say, um, hey, man, uh, yeah, go ahead and just keep the last 24 hours at all times. And uh, no, it doesn't go to any law enforcement unless I allow it. But like, uh, just like we're seeing black boxes in, in automobiles, the ability to kind of have a black box for your home to a lot of people might be something that makes them feel more comfortable. I mean, what do you, what do you think, Father Robert? Yeah, it's, it, it is an interesting technology. I mean, we don't really know exactly how much is being processed on the box versus how much is being processed in the cloud. But as Lou mentioned, it's a combination of the two. A lot of the processing will be happening inside your box. So when you ask it to do something, it's actually going to convert your speech into text, and then it's going to query. But, and this is where I think there's another enterprise aspect here, there is a huge potential for the use of big data within the Xbox Live community. Uh, imagine this, and, and Curtis, I'm going to throw over to you. Maybe you can check me on this logic. One of the things that Enterprise would love to get would be personal preferences. Using Bing's search graph, using things like the natural language query uh, tool in order to figure out what things are trending. What do people want right now? Where is the, where's the pulse of America, the pulse of the consumer? Xbox One could actually do that, even if it's only turning over the queries that are actually queries, not not all the nefarious, I'm listening 24 hours a day. Do you see this being a huge tool for Microsoft? I mean, if if they can get an Xbox into 70 million homes, they got 77 million Xboxes out there right now. Let's say they, they one up that, let's say they go 100. They get 100 million Xboxes into homes. They get all that immediate data that's it's not filtered, it's very raw, and they can use it to, to drive it through their, 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 their uh, big data engines any way they want. What kind of data can they extract from that? Well, uh, to use your numbers, if they could put 100 million of these in homes and they get the sort of data that would let them absolutely not notice any disappointment from a possible lack of sales of Windows 8 licenses, uh, this would be something approaching a holy grail. It's, it's getting close to Google-type critical mass in terms of big data. And you're absolutely right. The ability to put this kind of data together, especially if people actually do use the Xbox One as Microsoft seems to intend, where it becomes the everything box, the single box through which a consumer gets to essentially every online form of entertainment and through which they comment on that entertainment and collaborate on things around that entertainment. If they do all of that, even if the data coming back is randomized, then Microsoft has an enormous store of data. They can take that, slice it and dice it, use it to target advertising, use it to target new service offerings, use it to target all kinds of interesting software and services to those consumers. It is an absolute mountain of gold to the extent that it exists in a highly compact, highly dense form around each consumer. If Microsoft can get people to do that, then they really have struck gold. Lou, I'm going to come to you in just a bit, so I want to give you a heads up. I'm going to be asking you about how Microsoft plans to well, assuage some of the security concerns, but I want to go to Brian first. Brian, let me give you a hypothetical here. We already know that services like Netflix put great effort into taking the, the user play data, what you're watching, how long you're watching it for, how you search, when you watch, they actually can pull some really, really cool information out of that big data set. What if on your Xbox, you start seeing advertising or you start seeing content that you feel is, wow, Xbox, you really know me. You know that I want to watch the next episode of Archer. And so you, you put it out there and it, you made it really easy for me to buy. Or you know that I'm always looking for for uh, uh, manganese for, for some reason, for some trick that I'm always doing. And so you're putting rare earth elements into my shopping cart and you're, you're waiting for me to purchase them. What happens the first time you realize Microsoft's using my searches, they're using my content plays, they're using my game activity to pitch me things? Uh, dude, it's going to go a step beyond that. Picture, picture ten years past what you're talking about. They already said that the new, uh, the new Connect has such high fidelity and uh, uh, I assume temperature modeling or uh, monitoring capability that they're able to physically see heartbeats and see temperatures and stuff. Imagine what happens when all of a sudden movies and television become uh, actively edited on the fly as it sits there and watches you watching the entertainment, trying to match it. On the one hand, it feels like to us now, it feels like a horrific you know, a privacy violation. But on the flip side, 
all they're really trying to do is to give you the best experience that you p can possibly get. And I don't know where that middle ground is going to end up being with consumers between feeling like it's a violation of their personal space and in their living room versus getting enhanced uh, performances of everything that they see. And especially it gets dicey when you think in terms of, of trying to sell you stuff. Right. Evan Dunn and Beatmaster in the chat room are, are, are going full tinfoil hat. And Evan Dunn wants to know, well, are they going to use the Connect to be able to tell when we've got multiple people watching, say, an NFL game and charge us accordingly? And uh, Beatmaster says, well, no, Microsoft would never do anything like, say, put ads into Skype now, would they? Now, okay, let, let's put that aside. We're going to come back to that later. Lou, I want to give you the last word on this particular segment, and that is, these are privacy concerns that people are going to have because we always have privacy concerns when it comes down to enterprise gathering data. But on the other hand, coming from the enterprise side, we need this data, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole idea of building out these huge networks. It's to gather these data points. What can Microsoft do to be able to gather this data without ticking off its user base? Well, see, there's always going to be conspiracy theories. I mean, I've, I've worked there long enough to know that Microsoft attempts to think about all these things. And one of the things, you know, I'll, I'll even point you to the Connect Privacy and Online Safety Guide that they have on, online there. It even talks about this. I mean, one of the things that it does is, it, even though it's always on, it's in a low power mode. And what it does is it listens to you use specific keywords like Xbox or Connect. And when it does hear that, um, then it starts actually processing what you're actually doing. So it's not technically always listening on your room and trying and, and watching. It, in fact, the, the, the video is not even on. So that's kind of one of the things that, and it, it's mostly the infrared that's actually on to basically detect if there's, if there's somebody trying to interact with the device. So there's a lot of things that people don't really know from the technology standpoint that they, they just automatically jump to a privacy concern. So to me, personally, I don't think that there really is anything there yet. Uh, I'm sure that there will be hackers that will jump on board and try to get take advantage of it sooner or later. But I don't think right up front we're going to see, you know, they're, they're obviously taking advantage. They're taking uh, security measures to make sure things like that don't happen. But, of course, going back to your question is that, you know, around the data, I mean, that's kind of the key is they, they're going to take specific data points, you know, interacting with the system, um, whether it be language support, you know, let's say somebody doesn't speak English very well or, you know, other things around, um, you know, utilizing uh, pictures and video, how good is your video, how bad is your video. They'll look at your expressions and tell if it's good or bad, if you're enjoying, if you're not enjoying, if you're excited, if you're not excited. And those types of data points is really going to change the experience of the games that you have, whether it's the games or end or the video. So, I mean, I think that those are the kind of the key points they're kind of driving at. And I don't think they're, you know, looking to do like the advertising type things, but you never know. No. Coming up next, we are going to dive right back into the Xbox news. We're going to be talking about privacy. We're going to be talking about their data centers. We're going to be talking about, well, how you do a product launch. But before that, I do want to take a moment to thank our first sponsor. And that is, of course, the sponsor that's been with us since the beginning, Citrix and Go to Meeting with HD Faces. Now, the people that we work with the most aren't always the ones who are there, who are there in our offices, in our faces every single day. We have coworkers who are always on the go. We have coworkers who are in different offices, in different cities, in different states, in different countries. Clients are spread across the globe, and what well, we need a way to cope. We need a way to work efficiently. We need a way to communicate both our ideas and to listen to the ideas of others in order to make sure that we're on the same page. That's why we use GoToMeeting with HD Faces, the powerfully simple way to meet online and see each other face to face. Now, with GoToMeeting by Citrix, your team is just a click away. You share the same screen to collaborate in real time and just turn on your webcam to make your online meeting an HD video conference. It feels like you're in the same room. You launch or join a meeting from anywhere using your computer, smartphone, or tablet. You can even present from your iPad. Now, you may have noticed that I am particularly enthusiastic about GoToMeeting. Every time I have them on the show, I get excited. Well, that's because I use it on an almost daily basis for work, and for podcasting. I'm not just a spokesman for GoToMeeting, I'm a customer. You see, my work has me meeting with literally hundreds of coworkers and colleagues each month. I used to jump in a plane every time I had a meeting because that was the accepted way of getting face-to-face -face time. I switched to GoToMeeting with HD Faces, and I haven't looked back. Not only did it cut my travel time in per month in half, but it allowed me to have more interaction with the people I need to collaborate with the most. It saved my organization money, saved me time, wear and tear, and most of all, saved my sanity. 
I love GoToMeeting. It's easy to use, and with HD Faces, it's just like meeting in person. So here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code ENTERPRISE. Remember, use the promo code ENTERPRISE. GoToMeeting, meeting is believing. And wait, oh wait, no, we're, we're not done yet. That's right. Because as you know, GoToMeeting with HD Faces lets you meet face-to-face -face with your team, no matter where in the world everyone is located. But we have heard a complaint that some people say, well, my, my HD camera is not up to snuff, or I don't like the camera that's contained on my laptop. Well, guess what? Citrix is going to give away HD video cameras to one, two, three, four lucky customers. If you could have a meeting with anyone famous, living or not, who would you want to meet with? Now, using GoToMeeting with HD Faces, who would it be and why? If you can answer that question, and you can answer that question on Twitter using hashtag, hashtags Enterprise Webcam and GoToMeeting, you can have a chance to win a free HD webcam courtesy of GoToMeeting. Remember, to be eligible to win, you need to tell us who you would have your face-to-face GoToMeeting with and why using Enterprise Webcam and GoToMeeting hashtags. The contest ends Wednesday, May 29th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Time, and the winner will be announced on the Monday, June 3rd episode of this very show. Contest is open only to U.S. residents. For contest rules and regulation, visit the inside.twit.tv blog. Go to meeting, meeting is believing, and we thank Citrix for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now let's get back to it. I got a question for the panel, and that is... Will Xbox One bring Bing along for the ride? We know that Bing's been languishing for a while. Microsoft has pumped a lot of money into the search engine. And, uh, well, it's it's getting profitable, but it's not quite there yet. Bing is going to be built into every Xbox One. And, and, in fact, Microsoft will be providing Xbox One's natural language query engine to drive searches on Bing. They're going to try to make it as easy as possible to be able to leverage the search graph, the social graph, and all the different data that they're collecting on you in order to give you the most relevant services and the most relevant searches. Let me throw this back to you again. Brian, are you willing to give up a little bit of your privacy in order to have Xbox give you a prime search each and every single time you ask it? Now, hold on. What do you mean? Like, why, why would I need to give up any privacy for it? It seems like, uh, I mean, if Bing is the back end, the backbone of their search engine, then, uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't care. Like, uh, in general, the Bing It On Challenge, I think, has been a very good marketing effort on Microsoft's part because every time I've done it, I've tried it like two or three times, I keep picking the uh, the Bing searches as being superior to Google, uh, but then but then I just keep using Google because I consider myself a Google guy. It's the Coke and Pepsi thing all over again. But like if they're making the back end, uh, sure, of course they would use Bing as their primary search engine for the Xbox. But the question is, are they going to market it that way? That's that's what's interesting to me. Is do they perceive this as a way to have some of uh, the positive associations that we have with uh, Xbox rub off on Bing? Uh, I don't know. So how about right. that? Here's an answer that didn't answer anything for you. Well, <laughs> let me stretch that out a little bit, and I, I'm going to throw this over to, to you, Curtis. Google Now does this awesome feature where if you're willing to give up some privacy, if you're willing to let it collect data about you, specifically about you, uh, they showed off at I.O. last year this ability to say, let's say I start searching for I have uh, pain in my left arm or I can't breathe or uh, I'm, I'm having difficulty standing. It actually will accumulate this and, and, and also look at the other pieces of data that is collected about you, where you eat and how often you exercise and where your destinations are and how much time you spend in front of the computer, how much time you spend in front of the car. And it will actually self-diagnose and say, I think you're having a heart attack. Would you like me to find you a hospital? Or would you like me to call you a cab? Google Now is actually proactive. And the way it's proactive is because it's been gathering information about you. What would you do if Bing started doing the same thing? Well, I think that it, it's going to depend. I know people, uh, I had a uh, commenter on a back channel here just uh, a moment ago mention someone I know who has essentially disconnected from Google entirely uh, precisely because of that information gathering and what they do with it because they see not only the possibility for assistance but the possibility of some far less benign uses of that information. I think that there will be some people 
uh, who would treat being the same way if it started doing the same sort of thing with that amount of data. On the other hand, what we're seeing broadly is a trend for individuals to be more than willing to trade privacy for convenience and assistance. And I don't know that that's a bad thing as long as it's an informed decision. Your privacy is in some ways a fungible asset in today's marketplace. You can trade access to your information, your data for things that are of value to you. And I think there are a lot of people who, if they were in the process of having a stroke or a heart attack, would be more than happy for Bing or Google or, frankly, aliens from Jupiter to call help for them. Now, <laughs> the question is the informed part of that. That's where we're still growing as an online community. A lot of people are just giving away their privacy willy-nilly not understanding the kind of value they can extract in return. For those people, there could be some negative consequences. We've seen all kinds of things regarding cell phones that, that bring this to mind. But for a lot of people, I think that if Microsoft can deliver these predictive results that are of genuine value, the consumers are gonna be more than happy to make that trade privacy for service. Lou, let me throw this over to you. That, that's actually a great point. And that is, should we just now, in this age, in this age of, of social graphing, in this age of big data, should we just get used to, we're going to have to hand over some personal information? I mean, it sounds really bad. And I know there are going to still be privacy nuts like myself who will say, no, I, I don't give you permission to take any of my data. But it seems like we're heading into an era where the trade-off can actually be pretty dang good. Uh, looking at the Xbox One, looking at that Advanced Connect 2 sensor that can actually detect heartbeat. I can I can detect heart rate by the shading of my skin. That's how good the camera it is. If, I, if I'm willing to give up things like my, my social graph, if I'm willing to give up things like my connections, my searches, my, my time in front of the Xbox, and it can give me some usable data that could maybe not save my life but make my life better, is, is that a good trade-off? I mean, is that something that you think consumers will buy? You know, there's there's a lot of camps of users, and and you know, I'd say just depending on generations, and and you know, some of the newer generations are obviously accepting all that. I mean, if you think about it, all these search engines use machine learning, and if you, at the heart of machine learning, if there's no data, especially privacy data, um, sometimes they just don't. They're just not effective. And I think that if you're willing to give up some of that data, you know, and we're not talking like you know, crazy things, um, you know, we're talking about maybe expressions and, and other things, but you know, when, when, you know, if you really get up some of that data, I mean, these things can learn and again, make, you know, make your experience that much better. And again, it's a generation thing. You know, some people believe that privacy is privacy and I don't want to give any of my information regardless of how well it's going to help me or not. I want to, I want to, I want to discuss, I want to determine when that information gets out there. And then when it does get out there, then uh, you know, and I can control what gets out there and then they can make decisions on what I control. And I think that that's what a lot of viewers have that. And so I think that, you know, for me, I'm OK with it because there's a lot of things that I put out and I'm, I'm very judicial about what I put, what I do on the Internet and what I do on my machine. And so like that, I know that what the decisions they're making about me is based off the information that I'm willing to give. And so I think that that's kind of the key. And I, I think that, you know, on another another spectrum is this machine learning type thing, the more you're willing to give, the better it's going to be. It doesn't matter what system it is, Google, Bing, whatever. And so, you know, as these systems start to do it, if you're willing to do it, it it's going to make your experience that much better. I like that. The more you're willing to give, the better it's going to be. Now, Brushwood, you're the libertarian here. Why are you not yelling and screaming and shaking the trees? Isn't this the nightmare scenario, the death of privacy? Shouldn't we ban Xbox Ones across the world? What's going no. on? Oh, see, that, that's that, that's the difference. Is is the, the libertarian slant is is it's it's by mutual consent. Both parties agree. I understand I have something of value, which is my personal data. You understand that 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 you would like to access it, and in exchange, I get a discount or whatever. It's like, look, man, nobody forces you to. To buy an Xbox One. Um, so it's, in, in that regard, I'm not worried about it. And, and to be honest, I think that there could be a net positive to, uh, to, to allowing more access. Now, we need to maintain a certain level of um, hygiene with the data to keep it anonymized so that people aren't violated. But 
if you want to know where this is all headed, you can watch the war be played out in the press because it's, it is amazing to me that millions of people is driving billions of man miles all across uh, the country doing 60 miles an hour in opposite directions, separated by less than two feet of distance. And by mutual consent, we all respect this little yellow line. To me, the miracle of, of daily existence is not, uh, you know, the tragedy of when somebody decides to take another person's life. It's how amazingly nobody ever wants to. It's all the people who don't steal. It's all the people who don't kill each other. Uh, and the question is with privacy, this is a new area for us. And the question is, um, is the trade-off of privacy going to be used in order to enhance our entertainment experiences, to save lives, as we've already talked about, or will it be used to to crush people and, and take them down? And to be honest, it's like, I think, I think the miracle of life is that people are good in general, and I suspect that, um, that we're going to see a lot of positive stories of how these trade-offs uh, go to to create net benefits for humanity and that we won't see a lot of people trying to to, to be crushed. I mean, maybe that's me being a little bit Pollyanna, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm weirdly just not all that worked up about it. I am in Preshwood. I was expecting you to start yelling 1776. <laughs> yeah, murder pills. Pierce. <laughs> all right, let's move on a little bit. Let's get back into the, uh, the more enterprisey side here. Uh, Lou, we've got uh, news from the announcement that there are going to be 300,000 servers dedicated to the Xbox Live service. But we heard from Mary Jo Foley that, um, well, they're not going to be Azure. So Azure is going to be running the, the cloud storage and the offloaded processing on the Xbox One. But those 300,000 servers, are, are they're not running Microsoft's Azure. Why is that? So that's a good question. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give my opinion rather than I'm not really sure. But um, so what I do know is Azure obviously is consumer facing. And so we use a lot, a lot of companies and, and businesses, even I use Azure for things like sites and, and CPU processing and storage. And um, one of the things with Xbox is, you know, you have millions of users up front. As soon as you turn the Xbox on and get on the live, even the even when they ship that that first day, everyone's going to open their Xbox and plug it into the internet. And one of the things that they probably don't want to do is start bogging down and getting and getting into trouble with these other businesses and these other and these other uh, cloud you know cl private clouds that they're actually implementing on Azure. And so uh, it, it kind of makes sense from a business perspective is that they you know they do a lot of things on Azure and they, the Azure is capable of doing scalability and all of this stuff. But they also want to protect itself, protect that product as well from the massive amount of users that are just going to jump on instantaneously that first day and, and, and see that offload. And so I think that that's kind of the key around it is, you know, they want to have some dedicated boxes that just do Xbox. And they're not based off the consumer uh, set of uh, machines that actually do Azure. And, and it only makes sense from a scalability standpoint. All right. Curtis, let me throw over to you. One of the reasons why they're going to be having 300,000 servers is because, well, Xbox has uh, a feature that's going to allow us to register our games for our console. Now, I, I don't want to speculate. There have been some rumors that Xbox is going to charge a fee or Microsoft will charge a fee if you try to sell your game or loan your game to somebody else. That's all unconfirmed, so please don't go crazy flying off the handle about that. But... <laughs> is this really just a head off the enterprise disaster that EA had when they released The Sims and all their back end servers melted down, keeping people from playing? Is, is this, was that 300,000 number just a way for Microsoft to assure people, yes, we're going to be using DRM, but no, we're not going to be EA? Well, I think for most users, the, the two are, are somewhat non related. Uh, because most people see DRM as a long-term problem. They see the number of servers as a short-term problem. I think the 300,000 number was probably a Microsoft attempt to say, we will do whatever it takes to make this a success, to keep our systems from getting in the way of you enjoying your game. Um, the, the interesting thing is that in a world of elastic computing, which is what cloud is, we have to have a, a hard number in order to, to feel confident. To me, the real statement of confidence would have been, you know, 
we have a baseline that is perhaps 200,000, 300,000, pick a number, but we have contracted with companies so that regardless of what the load is, we will meet it. Uh, I think that may be where they've actually gone, but to me, in a cloud computing world, that's the kind of statement that would really engender confidence among the consumers. Yeah, I like that. All right, let's move to the last topic I've got for the Xbox launch, and that is, well, this is a little weird. This is the art of the product launch. So companies like Microsoft and Samsung have recently had big uh, launches that maybe didn't go as well as they could have. They could have been better. Some people were really negative about them. Both of these companies have pulled back a lot from CES, big shows like CES. In fact, Microsoft is no longer at CES because they decided to focus on their own product launches. Essentially, and let me give credit where credit is due, they've decided they want to follow the Apple motif of a product launch. Rather than having cycles at which they artificially push their product out, they said, no, we're, we're going to have an event that's just for us, just for our products, and we're going to put all our eggs into that PR basket. But... The fact that Samsung's and Microsoft's launches could have been better, they could have been better planned, they could have been better executed, what does that tell us about a successful product launch? And this is, this is a lesson that can go all across the industry. You don't have to be a big multi-billion dollar company. Can nobody do a product launch like Apple? Brian, let me throw this to you first. Oh, look, I mean, that's... Uh... Okay, so fine. Like Pele is good at soccer and you see Pele, you're like, man, if I, I'll just try to be like Pele. And then you get out there and you're not as good as Pele. By the way, I'm making sure to use very up-to-date references for all the people <laughs> who are still living in 1977. <laughs> so what? You're not Pele. Who cares? It's like, look, that doesn't mean it's good or bad to not try to, to, to emulate the lessons that you can learn from it. And, and companies, just like individuals, have to discover their own voices. Um, I... Uh, I, I I don't know what the answer is for that. In fact, it's <laughs> in my job to tell you guys the answers. I don't give that advice for free. Just go figure out something. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Now, Lou, I shouldn't ask you this question because I'm sure there's going to be a conflict of interest, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think it could be hilarious. And that is, did Apple really do awesome, great, fantastically world-shaking product announcements, or were they just masters of hype? You know, that's not a loaded question actually, at all. I was actually going to say that. I was going to say it regardless of how you know what my conflict of interest was. Is that you know with Steve Jobs, I think he he had this he had this ability. Everyone knew his history, and they had history with him, and they could relate to him. And when he actually did these presentations, everyone kind of felt like they were you know they knew him. And the way he actually presented was they sh he showed his the, these devices in a way they got you excited. And when these these other companies they come in, even Apple today does this, is they come in and they they throw these other people at you. They have no history. You don't know who they are. You don't know what kind of charisma they have. And they just try to present these products in a similar way, just like Brian said. And they just don't come off the same. And no one no one's like engaged as they were with Steve, with, with Steve Jobs. And I think that that's the problem with these companies. They try to emulate and they don't get there because they just don't have that history. That's why some of these companies are trying to give you a face for their product. They'll pick one specific person and they'll show you them over and over and over again. And every time you'll notice, they actually start to get more charismatic and more energized. And they try to get on that. And that's kind of like... I hate to say this, but it's kind of what Steve Ballmer does is, you know, he's they call him the monkey boy because he likes to run around and jump and get <laughs> freaky. Right. And that's kind of the thing is that people can relate to that now, even though it's kind of crazy and, and weird. It's just that's what he does to kind of get you energized and everyone know it's coming. In fact, we wait the entire time for that presentation for that to come. And I think that that's kind of the key is, you know, we, these companies are trying to emulate and they're just not getting there. Uh, just let me throw. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Go, go ahead. Fast. <laughs> nice dud. Already we got the fist pumping. <laughs> uh, uh, real quick, Padre SJ. Early on, I was I mentioned offhandedly that they talked about the fact that they could actually detect heartbeats or whatever. Uh, and some of the chat room was a bit incredulous about it. And uh, I finally found. I've been watching this whole time. This is some footage from an MIT project where basically by looking at color differences and amplifying them, you're able to actually see an infant's pulse live. Like this is the kind of technology that is going to fundamentally change our, uh, you know, the, the way we encounter our er, entertainment in the future. And I, th I do think that the Xbox One is going to get us closer to that. I don't know why. That was like an itch I had to scratch before we could. It was an OCD <laughs> thing. That's all on me. Sorry. Now, I, I know this is more of a frame rate topic, but can you, can you imagine if Xbox One had the ability to detect how excited someone was, was getting watching a particular piece of content? 
so that you can go back to the showrunners and say, hey, when you did this scene, that you had them, that you had everyone. Their pulse rate was elevated. They seemed really, really focused on the screen. That's the kind of data that a device like the Xbox One really could collect if if we let it. Well, and, and at the very least, in a rudimentary level, it could do things like monitor you watch because it's running through the HDMI thing. Imagine if you're like, hey, you can get, uh, you can either pay $50 a year for an Xbox Gold membership or uh, participate in this program. Xbox Live will be totally free. Uh, and in exchange, we just get to monitor data points that are totally anonymized. And, and they could do things like watch your physical reaction to the content you're doing. And then they'd be able to go back and be like, hey, on this latest episode of this show, uh, this is when all the heartbeats were racing. Uh, this is when 50% of the populace jumped out of their chair and grabbed their hair and freaked out. These are where we saw, saw loud volume events or whatever. Like all of these things could be used in order to, to I mean, as, as filthy as it sounds for something that's <laughs> supposed to be an art, these are things to enhance the viewer experience at the end. And there's a dollar value associated to these things. And if you got willing buyers and willing sellers, I mean, weirdly, I'm okay with all that. It's real-time Nielsen on crack. Yeah, but, exactly, exactly. But here's the ethical thing. If you have someone who's also been searching for all sorts of heart medications, if their heart rate starts to get too high, do you flash up a screen that says, you know, you should probably watch some kittens now. You're, you're getting a little too excited. I, all sorts of ethical questions come up with this sort of technology. I want the Xbox not to even ask. I want it to stop showing Battlestar Galactica, which is driving his heart rate too high, and just start showing the kittens. I, I think that's that's the next step. So I'm sorry, we have to pause this, watch this for 10 minutes. All right, now it's I'm going to call this thing. segment. I'm, I'm going to call this segment because we do have to move on. But before we do, I'm going to have the very last word. This is from an article in Slate. Um, I, I thought it was actually, it, it was kind of cool. Listen to, to some of the negativity. I, I read this about is the Xbox One Steve Jobs' dream device? Now, before he died, Steve Jobs told his biographer, Walter Isaacson, about his dream for revolutionizing television. His fantasy, his fantasy device would control all the many doodads that crowd your living room. DVRs, game console, Blu-ray players would connect to the vast world of entertainment available online. Best of all, it would be drop-dead simple to control. No more futzing with the input button to switch between different kinds of content. No more fiddling with different remotes to control your device. It will have the simplest user interface you could imagine, Jobs said. And I finally cracked it. Well, did he crack the Xbox One? Now, I'm going to leave that troll bait in there, and I'm going to move on to our sponsor. Wait, 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 Go, Shwood, go, go. I, 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 before this, but let me just pull back the curtain just a little bit, Father Robert, because I'm <laughs> looking at the dock, and let me just point, I'll just lay that out there. This segment was labeled Pissing oh, on the Dead. didn't have to show them that. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have showed that. I'm sorry, but I'm just, you want to talk troll bait? That's mega troll bait. Now it let's was, talk to our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> and now from Pissing on the Dead, let's go to our sponsors. <laughs> now, I do want to take some time <laughs> to talk a little bit about our next sponsor because, you know, they've been absolutely fantastic. Now, when Leo built the brick house, we chose to do as much as we possibly could in the cloud because we decided to eat our own dog food. If we're telling people to go into the cloud, we thought Twitch should go into the cloud itself. And so everything we do is in the cloud. Our email, our storage server, our documents, all of our schedules are synchronized in the cloud. So when Russell, our IT guy, told us that we could do our phone system in the cloud, well, it was a no-brainer. We love Ring Central. There are zero startup costs. There's no PBX hardware to install or maintain. Ring Central allows us to easily customize all of our call handling. Our producers get their voicemail in their emails, and we can even get all of our fax messages right on our smartphones. And now they have a new feature. It's the Ring Central app for Salesforce. You can integrate all of your phone calls with your CRM system seamlessly. Create new records for contacts and leads and create real-time call notes while you're on the call. It really makes your CRM more productive and it's easy to use. So here's what we can do. Ring Central offers all-inclusive pricing as low as $20 per month per user. You can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial and they have a special offer for my listeners. When you buy one desk phone, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. So call this number, designated for my listeners, 800-543-9980. That's 800-543-9980. Once again, just in case Xbox One wasn't listening, 800-543-9980. 
Or you can go to ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. That's ringcentral.com, promo code TWIT. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get to the last segment of the show. Now, we're talking all about uh, enterprise domain rights. Now, that's the wrong way to say it. I think the better way to say it is who owns your name. That's right. We've got a story here from Domain Name Wire about Ron Paul being found guilty of reverse domain name hijacking. Now, in February of 2013, Ron Paul brought cyber squatting complaints against the owners of ronpaul.com and ronpaul.org. Now, ronpaul.com was created in 2008 as a fan site. A fan site. They've raised millions of dollars for Ron Paul's presidential campaigns. Ronpaul.org was originally owned by Ron Paul, but was snatched up by his supporters when he failed to re-register the domain in August of 2012. Now, after retiring from Congress, Ron Paul fired a complaint with the WIPO, that's the World Intellectual Property Organization, asking them to confiscate the domain name without compensation. The supporters had offered to give Ron Paul ronpaul.org and ronpaul.com, but Ron Paul filed the, with the WIPO. Now, the WIPO decided that ronpaul.org was a reverse domain name hijack because Ron Paul filed the complaint after it had been it had been offered to him for free. They also decided that ronpaul.com was not a hijack because they had supported Ron Paul's campaign and they had in fact received thank you notices from the Ron Paul campaign during his last presidential run. Now, this is all a long way of getting to the point of should you be able to own your name? I mean, on, on the internet, with domains, across the world, if someone registers your name, shouldn't it be a cut and dry case for you to be able to get that back? Let me go to you first, Brian, because I know you're a libertarian and you're going to have sure. certain stances on this. But was it wrong of the WIPO to deny Ron Paul this claim? I will say, okay, first of all, and the claim was specific. Now, why wouldn't he just take it for free when they offered it? Uh, that that's a really good question. My my uh, feeling is that he probably got some really bad advice, uh, thinking that if he if he takes it without some sort of court action, there got could it. be consequences. Sure. Uh, let me say this: I do not perceive that you are entitled to a domain that happens to match your name. It seems like the kind of thing that uh, if you're smart, you'll get there early. You'll get the land grab and make it happen. But if your last name happened to be McDonald's. Uh, you don't get to take it away from the McDonald's Corporation or ask that the hammer of law be used for that kind of thing. Um, and it's this seems like a very un-Ron Paul way to handle it. The fact that the well, I mean, I guess he used the structures that there, the WIPO, and uh, to to grab it. But uh, but uh, no, man, you don't you don't deserve a thing just because it happens to seem right. Because also, for example, you know, I registered Schwood.com in what 1998. And uh, only two years ago, there's some there, there's a sunglass company called Schwood that I'm sure would really like my domain now. And uh, and I still like the same thing on Twitter and all this stuff. And they, they're at schwoodshop.com. Uh, I would not be happy if they were able to file a thing that says like, well, we're here now and our name's Schwood, so we deserve this domain. So it's like, no, the answer is, um, you know, if you want it, either buy it, come to an agreement or be first. Outside of that, go Go, go hang yourself. Do something I, else, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying really hard to keep it PG here. There's a lot of things I want to say. And, and I do appreciate that. Curtis, let me throw this over to you because this is a recurring problem for the enterprise where someone will buy a domain either really, really close to the domain that you've spent hours and millions of dollars developing and then try to drag away some of your, uh, uh, some of your, your, your traffic, some of your hits. Is this something that uh, we need to have better protocol on? I mean, Ron Paul went to the WIPO because that's sort of the established way to do it at the moment. But it seems kind of weird that if if I say, if I own Microsoft.com and someone registers Microsoft.whatever, a, a different TLD, that uh, I could have no recourse to say, hey, you can't do that. Well, I think that this means that companies are going to need to register, you know, every TLD they can think of. Smart companies go ahead and register as many common misspellings of their domains as they need to, because let's face it, basic registrations on an enterprise scale don't cost any money. They're, they're very cheap. 
We've also seen that if, in fact, you have a domain that you've been using uh, that does match your company name or matches a product for yours, and someone does come in and essentially squat on it some, through some of the other TLDs, that there are processes that will let you have it. The reason that I don't think that Ron Paul had any claim on this was because he ignored some of the rules. He had, in fact, been offered the domain for free. People had tried to do the right thing. He rejected all of those attempts and then came in and tried to get the WIPO to come in and clean up for him afterwards. That's not their job. And I respect them for saying, look, at some level, we have to follow the rules and play nicely together if this is all going to work. It's a very uncharacteristically unbureaucratic thing for an organization like this to do. And I think they should be applauded for it uh, rather than condemned. Although I have to ask, I have to say, I have no idea what it's supposed to mean when they say he's found guilty of reverse domain name hijacking. I think they just made that up. <laughs> but OK, let me go over to you, Lou. Give me a, a, an inside the company view of this sort of stuff, because Microsoft gets this all the time. They're a big name. They're a big brand. They spent a lot of money on the brand and they can't have anyone confusing their brand with something else that they're trying to do. What does Microsoft typically do? How do they typically handle it if they have someone who has figured out a way to either use a new top level domain or some unique spilling of Microsoft to try to pull away well, uh, the, the the branding from Microsoft itself. You, you, everyone knows. I mean, Microsoft has like Uber resources, right? So when they when they see these types of things, the first thing they do is they, they're they're civil about it. You know, they come to they go to the person and they say, you know, we want this domain. You know that I mean that would just make sense. And that's why you see a lot of these companies, even Silicon Valley today, they're 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 coming up with these these crazy names for their app for their for their businesses. And then they like just like Curtis said, they go buy like. $10,000 worth of domains, you know, all the bad words in the world and all the different variations and all the d different TDLs. So to make sure that, that nobody kind of does that sort of thing. And Microsoft didn't necessarily have that capability up front. And so they, you know, they have to take a different route. They have to take that civil approach of, of saying, you know, well, first approach it. Maybe they'll give it to us. Maybe they'll make us pay for it. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll, uh, you know, maybe they'll keep it for a while. You know, maybe we do some, 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 some tricks around rounding things. I mean, it just all depends on how, what they can do uh, to kind of get that domain. And I, I think that, you know, it's, it's of that person. I mean, I can go buy a domain today called Microsoft is fantastic or something. And I own it now. Right? I mean, that's just, that's just how the world works. And I think that people should start accepting it. And, uh, you know, if they, they come up with a company and it's, you know, branded in a specific way, somebody might come up with something bad for it. I mean, that's just how things are going to roll. I love the chat room. PC guy in the chat room just brought up a story to my attention. Jason, it's in the dock now. Microsoft doesn't own the Xbox One domain names, but they're fighting <laughs> to get them. It's this, this is actually an interesting story. So now we have, we have another non-Ron Paul story. This is actually involving Microsoft. Microsoft has just announced the Xbox One, uh, and they're going to have to fight to get the names of the ones. And anyone who had Xbox One in, in some form of domain name has suddenly hit the domain lottery. So, Brian, let me let me go back to you. So we've got a real world example here. What should happen? Should a, a cash offer be tendered? Should Microsoft have to pay or can now Microsoft say, no, look, we've registered this trademark. We own your domain. So here's what yeah, this entire thing. We've used a bunch of different words for it, but the story we're telling, even though it's a 21st century digital version of it, is a very familiar one. We're talking about eminent domain. We're talking about you got it. I want it. How do you resolve this? And and to me, you know, as a crazy nut job libertarian, the answer is you either come to an agreement with an exchange that is mutually beneficial for both parties, or it just doesn't happen. Or you you go off and sure. uh, here's a nutty idea: register some other domain. And yeah, you'll have to spend some money in order to make it happen. But what you don't do is use the hammer of law in order to steal something away just because you are in a position of authority that can actually make that happen. So yeah. You're right. The guy who owns xboxone.com won the lottery and he deserves to get paid because that's what happens when you win a lottery. You get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and let, uh, you know what? Me, Go ahead. I I'm was going to say, let me, let me give you an example uh, from back in the early days of the web. I knew a guy who had, was one of the early web programmers. This is back in about 1995. 
Uh, he had put up a website. He had registered his last name as the uh, the site. And uh, sure enough, uh, at one point, Microsoft came to him and said, you know, we'd like that domain and we're willing to pay you some money for it. And what they did, they wrote him a nice check. I mean, for a guy who was living in his parents' basement, it was a very good check. Uh, and offered to provide him with registration of any other domain he wanted. And so he got s some money, he got a new domain, and Microsoft ended up with Slate.com. See? Isn't, wow. and I think that's supposed to work. It's supposed to work like that, right? Well, I mean, that, keep in mind also, when, when people hear stories of this, they react to like, well, what did that guy do? He didn't provide anything of value. He just happened, he just got lucky. But the thing is, is... The focus is always on the success stories, the people who cash in and sell uh, Jesus.com for over a million dollars. And yet they roll their eyes like, well, that's that guy's just a cyber squatter or whatever. Uh, but what you don't realize is that this is a speculation market. And there are, for every one story like that, there are millions of losers, people who buy domains that they hope and suspect will be worth something someday and turn out to be useless. And so these people lose, you know, you got all these people who lose, you know, $30,000 in this speculative market. That's the way markets work, man. It's like you made a bet and you either won or you lost. And that's okay. That's how we get ahead in, the, in a free market system. Now, I want to close this segment. We're going to be coming right back to talk about what happens when Unlimited really isn't Unlimited. But before we do that, let's go ahead and have a little word about the third sponsor of the Twyat Riot, and that's TechServe. Now, Twyat is all about the enterprise. We try to keep a fair and balanced view of the tech and techniques that run the enterprise. But let me be honest with you, we don't spend a whole lot of time on Apple. And you know what? We, we really should. That's why I'm ecstatic that the latest member of the Twyat Riot is TechServe. Now, as New York's premier authorized Apple reseller and technology provider, TechServe serves creative professionals at all levels, from individual customers to Fortune 100 companies. TechServe carries a full range of Apple products, from iPhones and iPads to iMacs, MacBooks, iPods, and accessories. TechServe also has a range of partnerships with top vendors to facilitate flexible, efficient, and creative solutions for all your business needs. TechServe assists businesses of all sizes to deploy Apple, Avid, and Adobe solutions throughout the U.S. Whether you're committed to iPads or just getting started, from sales to support, process to practice, TechServe can help. Some amazing technology solutions are being deployed on iPads. If you've been to the Delta terminals in LaGuardia, Toronto, or Minneapolis, you may have noticed nearly every seat in the terminal is equipped with an iPad. Travelers can now sit anywhere in the terminal and receive real-time flight updates on the iPad or use the iPads to order food, play games, browse the internet, and check email while they're waiting. Over 1.5 million visitors used these iPads in Delta's terminals just this past year. The result has been a double-digit increase in food and beverage service and the highest customer satisfaction scores of all participating airports. OTG Management is the hospitality company behind Delta's terminals. They've turned to TechServe to provide, configure, and install the world's largest deployment of iPads, a number that just keeps growing as they add new terminals. And TechServe was the natural place to turn. They sell support, personalize, configure, and manage massive iPad projects, from the Delta terminals to a school with 700 chef instructors to an operation that delivered personally configured iPads to 3,000 cable technicians. TechServe is able to do full lifecycle management for all of your technology needs by providing the devices that you need, getting them up and running, teaching you and your staff how to effectively use them, and maintaining them so that they're working efficiently. TechServe also provides ongoing support so that if your enterprise has a problem, help is just a phone call away. Now, if you're considering adding iPads to your business, why not ensure the project's success with the world's most experienced partner? If your business is considering integrating iOS technology into your workplace, then contact TechServe today and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Visit TechServe.com slash Twyat and TechServe will help you assess your current or future iPad needs and give you advice to make it a success. That's TechServe.com slash Twyat. And we thank TechServe for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, one last story before we say goodbye, and that's about the limits of Fios's unlimited service. We've got a story from Ars Technica talking about a man in California who preferred not to be identified, who was called by Verizon, who kindly asked him what he was doing that used 50 terabytes of data a month. 
his peak usage being 77 terabytes in March of 2013. Now, the user says, I do some VPN stuff for people and web FTP, S FTP servers. A lot of friends and family stream stuff for me for my huge media collection. And also, I do some P2P and Usenet stuff. And I'm thinking it's probably more of the latter. He has a home data closet. He has dual 150 megabit per second business class connections that he dropped in order to switch to Fios because the home service had a price of, uh, of what was it, 100 and some dollars versus 340 for the dual 150s. His usage was three it was 30,000 times that of a typical user. Now, Lou, let me throw this over to you. Uh, when we say, when we see unlimited, we always know that there's going to be one or two people who abuse the heck out of that term. They, they don't really mean unlimited. They mean unlimited until you're starting to affect the, the uh, performance of our network, right? <laughs> You know what's funny is uh, that's that's one beef that I have. Even with AT and T, they did this: is when they say unlimited, oh well, we'll unlimited until somebody takes advantage of it, and then we're going to shut the door. I mean, I I just think if they're going to say unlimited, they should be held to that, no matter what it what it what it means from a data perspective. And they don't want people doing this, and they need to put some bans on it. And I think that that's kind of the key is here. This guy, you know. He's like, you know, I have this pipe and it's 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 unlimited and it's, you know, it's free. It's, it's it's this massive pipe that I can use for downloading things and uploading things. I mean, I even I have relatives that have server closets like this that have to that have Verizon files over in New York City and do the same exact thing. They run websites, they run file sharing, whatever you want to call it. I mean, these are these are the things. If Verizon doesn't want that happening, they need to kind of start shutting the door on things. And and I think that uh, they don't want to be known to be doing that. And so instead they just, you know, privately call this guy and say, hey. You know, what are you doing with this data? Can you maybe cut it down a little bit? But, you know, unlimited, if they say unlimited, it should be unlimited. Brian, what do you think about that? Because th this this is something that has caught several ISPs, be it T-Mobile, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, the Comcast. The whole idea is they like to say unlimited. Unlimited sounds great when you're marketing the product, but... They don't really mean unlimited, right? I mean, they, they mean unlimited to the marketing unlimited, which is buy it because you think you're getting everything. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man, that's the double-edged sword, isn't it? It's like you know that if you say the U word, you're going to get a certain amount of people instantly buying it and falling in love with it. And for a lot of them, you're going to be able to do it. But uh, but then there's that 10% that you're like, okay, we didn't mean your version of unlimited. Uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the solution is. And my guess is they'll figure it out by by trying to get away with as much as they can and then getting nailed in the press the way the way Verizon is right now because this guy sounds like he's using his service let's say legitimately just more than anyone else but uh but uh, look if you're the one on the flip side Verizon you're the ones who uh, uh danced with the devil by using the u word so it's like if you use the word u word you just got to be ready. You got to be prepared to wade into that backlash when somebody actually tries to use it like it's unlimited. Yeah. Curtis, we've got a couple of people in the chat room who are saying, look, unlimited should be unlimited. Go ahead and throttle me if I use too much, but I should never lose my connectivity. That seems to be a, a, a well, a policy that was featured by T-Mobile first, I believe. Uh, actually, AT&T did that, but in a more ham-handed way. What do you think about unlimited policies? I mean, specifically when we're talking about enterprise level technology, we have a lot of data transfers and yeah, we, we do rely on unlimited or at least we rely on a connection that will do what the, what the SLA says it will do. What happens if I, I, I sign an agreement and suddenly my ISP came, comes to me and says, well, I didn't realize you'd actually be using everything we thought we were selling you. So we're going to have to either charge you more or disconnect. Well, uh, as someone who has been on the receiving end of uh, some of those letters from an ISP going, you know, when we said you could use this much data at this speed, we really didn't mean the this much data part of it. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the user, and I think that if you say unlimited, then by golly, that's what it, it should mean. Now, there is an element of how do you protect everyone else? There are a couple of options. One is the throttling, and that seems to be less objectionable to a lot of people than just the hard cutoff. Uh, the other is to just go ahead and build out your infrastructure to support, by golly, unlimited. I think what we're going to see a lot more of, though, is what a number of ISPs have already done, and that is put in their terms of use limitations on the type of traffic that you can do. Now, not type of traffic in terms of uh, video or, or anything like that, but by saying things like you cannot have a publicly available server on a home system. 
That's what we've seen a lot of places do. That gets around some of this bi-directional stuff, and, and it would frankly throttle this particular case uh, by, by them saying, you know, you've said that you're letting your family and friends get access to your data. Well, that's running a publicly available server. That's a no-no. We're going to stop that particular traffic. Uh, it's a dance they have to do. Uh, the good news for consumers is that as more and more companies go to larger and larger fiber plants, it becomes less of an issue. Uh, the bad news is that until it becomes a non-issue, we're going to see these occasional hyper users causing problems for the rest of us. Gentlemen, I'm having a great time, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to call this Memorial Day episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech to a close. That's right. You spent another hour, actually a bit more than an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 12 minutes, listening to the best dang podcast in the universe. And yes, yes, I did hear from the almighty creator. It, it, it really is. But I do want to give my guest a chance to say goodbye. Curtis, what are the things that you're doing that the Twyat Riot need to know about? Well, Padre, next week, actually, I'm sorry, this week, as a matter of fact, tomorrow, we've got a great episode of E2 Radio, our first CIO coaching session that happens at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Then on Thursday, we've got another episode of E2 Radio where I'll be talking with Glenn Evans, the chief architect of the InteropNet, about the lessons he learned there and how he manages that wild bunch of characters that make up the NOC team. The week following that, I'm going to be on location at Microsoft's TechEd in New Orleans. Later on in June, I'll be live from the E2 conference in Boston, Massachusetts. Any of the Twyat Riot at either of those conferences, I'd love to do a face-to-face -face meetup with you. Always a pleasure to have you on, Curtis. You know that uh, you're part of the backbone of the Twyat Riot. Let's go over to you, Lou. Lou, thank you for coming back on. It is always a pleasure to have you, your, your, your bright, smiling face, and just the insight that you bring into the program. Tell us, what are the things that you can tell us at Microsoft without getting fired? <laughs> so working, still working day and night on uh, working on the Dynamics CRM division, day and night, uh, even on Memorial Day might be working. Um, so, I mean, these types of things, look, at, look out for CRM from a dice device near you. Uh, we're trying to go cross-platform, and we're doing a lot of work with that. And Curtis, I'll see you at TechEd. I'm going to be there, and uh, maybe we can do a little meet up there. Yeah, yeah. Brian Brushwood, host of uh, a couple of shows on the too many. on the Twit too, Network. Host, I, I, host of too what, many shows. That's that's my too official. Too many thing. shows, but but right now we're focusing on the fact that you are the uh, interactive entertainment specialist at the Network Solutions Forensics Worldwide Corporation. Uh, oh, whoa, whoa, what do whoa, you whoa, want whoa, the Twilight whoa, whoa. Riot to know about? I just now put together what you what joke you've been making this entire time. You're, you're talking about an NSFW show. It took me NSFW a show. There it you go. It took me an, an hour and change, but I'm actually there. Yes, I totally am that guy. And uh, you can see NSFW every Tuesday night. And uh, just follow me uh, at Schwood, S-H-W-O-O-D on Twitter. Yeah, thank you. And as long as we're doing call outs, uh, Jason. Oh? I, I, I've, I've been told by, a, by a, well, a reasonably dependable source that you host a show on the Twit Network. What no, exactly is that? No, 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 not me. That's my twin brother, uh, Jason with a Y. Uh, but he has a great show. It's called All About Android. It's at twit.tv slash AAA. And we talk about everything iPhone on All About Android. <laughs> Indeed. So if you want to get your iOS fix on Android, check out AAA. Every Tuesday at what time again? Uh, 5 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. And by the way, in case you were wondering, that's Jeff over there building some pretty impressive Lego. Uh, the Death Star, I believe. So. Wait, wait, wait. Do we pay him to do that? <laughs> Apparently we do. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. I, I, I want that job. Now also, to you. To the people who have been watching, to the people who make this program possible, thank you for coming back again and again and again. And you know what? Because I love you so much, we're going to do something for you. We're going to make it possible for you to get each and every single episode of Twyd into the device of choice automatically. That's right. Each and every single week, it'll just appear. It'll be like a present, a little gift from us to you. What you got to do to get that is to go to our show page at twit.tv slash 
If you look at the drop down menu, you'll be able to find all the different ways that you can get our program into the device of your choice. You want an audio version for the ride home? Sure, you can get that. You want the high definition version so you can watch it at home and see all the cool visuals that we put into the show? You can do that. You want to get it on your zombie zoo and your iPad, your Android device? It's all right there. Also, did you know that you could get our programming from our YouTube page? If you go to youtube.com slash twiet, not only will you be able to see all of our episodes, but you'll be able to find the uploaded versions of our individual segments. Stuff My IT Guy Says, The Data Closet, Pro Tip, Pro Gear, all those things are there for your perusal. Again, because we love you. Also, why not follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. And guess what? You could watch our show live each and every single week. That's right. Go to live.twit.tv at noon Pacific time, and you'll be able to see how the sausage is made. You get to see all the things pre-show and post-show that don't go into the final download. It's a, a way to prove the badge of honor. Viva la twit. And while you're there, why not drop into our chat room at irc.twit.tv where you'll be able to meet some of the greatest engineers, some of the most brilliant people, and some of the funniest trolls. It's all part of the experiment that is Twit. Thanks to CyberDog in the chat room for doing our show notes. Thanks to our super producer, Carson Bondi. Thanks to everyone at the Brick House who makes this show go. I'm Father Robert Ballester. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep twiet.